All right? And we're going to see where the Omer first appears in the Exodus, right around when we get the manna. Now, this is all, all this is tied in, see? So, if you will read for us, sir, and this started on the Shabbat, mm. if you read for us Exodus 16 okay. and verse Six, uh, 26, all the way to the end of the chapter, which is verse 36. So we're going to take the time to read these 10 verses. Okay. Exodus 16, verse 26 to 36, and it reads on this wise, Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Shabbat, there will be none. Now, it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh said to Masha, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for Yahweh has given you the Sabbath, Shabbat. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called its name manna. Mm. And it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it like wafers made with honey. Then Masha said, This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded. Fill it, fill an omer with it, to mm. be kept for your generations that they may see the bread which, with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Misraim. And Masha said to Aharon, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it and lay it up before Yahweh to be kept for your generations. As Yahweh commanded Masha, so Aharon laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And Benai Yisrael ate manna for 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. Uh -huh. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Total rebuff. So the reason I had him read that was to let you know that you, we, I, us, when we came out of Egypt, we were a few days out of Egypt. We we're right before getting the Torah in Exodus 19. So 50 days hadn't occurred. The first appearance of the word Omer dealing with us out of Egypt is right here. We started our count because 50 days after we came out of Egypt, we were at the base of of Mount Horeb in the Sinai Peninsula. Are you with me? So 50 yeah. days after you came out of slavery, you got the Torah. 50 days after you came up out of hell, you were given the laws of righteousness and freedom to guide the nation of the Creator who he was bringing forth out of captivity in Egypt into its own sovereignty and into its own autonomous state, you had to have something to guide you. You had to have something to lead you. So the 50 days are critical that we overstand this. When we deal with this, all right? When we deal with this way in Leviticus, it is a feast day, a kagin. But the significance too, Shavuot is tied into seed time and harvest. It deals with agricultural things. It deals with the first reference to us receiving the law 50 days after the exodus or after us coming out of captivity. So they're very important things that are tied to it. And Omir is one-tenth. He just read, right? Of an ephah. Huh? So in Dang. 
the offering that we are to offer at this time. Verse 18 of the 23rd chapter of the book of Leviticus gives us what I call the clarity behind what was offered in those times and what we were to offer. Most times we focus on the flesh. I want to focus on the flesh. I want you, I would like for you to focus on the grain. Huh? I would like for you to look at the fruits. I would like for you to look at those things that come out the ground for the harvest and not the firstborn of the flesh, but the first fruits of the ground, which refer to the first fruits of the spirit. Mm. Yeah. All right? Um, so if we look at this in 2317, it says, you shall bring from your houses or your dwellings two loaves of two tenths of an ephah. That means two ometers, huh? Because one omer is a tenth, huh? That's what it says. An omer is one tenth of an ephah. So two tenths. One omer has the weight, dry weight equivalent of approximately 34 or 35 liters or quarts. So if you combine them with two, the equivalent is 70. Now, that has significance to because 70 is the number of what? It numbers the number of the nations according to the number of the children of Israel. You say, Prince, how do you get the number of the nations according to the number of the children of Israel? Because when you count all the sons of Ham, 26, you count all the sons of Japheth, 14, and you count all the sons of Shem, 20, you do the math, it brings you to 70. When you count the number of Israelites that went down into Egypt, when we went to buy what? Grain. Grain? What grain did we went to buy? Maybe it was corn? Perhaps I'm going to tell you the season that we went down to buy grain was the wheat harvest season. So when we went down, we went down 70 in number. There's that number again. It's significant. 70 refers to the Hebrew word Toledo. And Toledo means generations or the perpetuity of generations, meaning your offspring. Your offspring, metaphorically, are referred to in the scripture as what? Zira. And Zira is what? Seed. Your offspring is seed. That which comes out of the matrix of the woman or the animal is the firstborn. It's the firstling. And that which comes out of the ground at the summer harvest, huh, is the first fruit of that which you receive from all your labor. So, Shavuot is the period of time where you observe a count of 50 days. Modify it to a period of seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49. Then we are told to count for yourself the day after the Shabbat from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Shabbat shall be completed. Seven times seven is 49. Verse 16 says, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat, 49th day, then you shall make a new grain offering unto Yahweh. Guess what, saints? It's the harvest time. That's what that is. That's the harvest time. Take us into the book of Leviticus 19, verse 9 through 12, you guys hear? Chapter 19, verse 9 through 12. And it reads on this wise. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am Yahweh Elohecha. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to anyone. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor, pro, you, nor shall you profane the name of your El, I am Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we set up provisions for the poor based upon what we had as land and the fruits that would come out of our own farms huh, for the 
disinherited for the poor of the community. So at harvest time, you went into the center. You went into the center of your crop, and you took its harvest. But you did not. This is why he's reading this. You, we did not wholly reap the corners of the field. So we left the corners north, south, east, west. All the corner points, the people could come up and they could eat your food freely. They can eat what had come up out the ground freely. Just don't go into the center, but you could eat what was on the outside. And the scripture tells you who they were for. Leave them for the poor and for the stranger, for I am Yahweh. Hmm. Now, though we had rules to follow, so did those who would be coming into the field have rules to follow. See, all this is really critical and really deep when we really begin to understand what Abba is saying to us and how we to govern ourselves. We had things in place to take care of the poor and the needy. And the poor and the needy knew the law. Okay, I can go into so-and-so's yard. I can go into Akoti so-and-so yard right at the edges. And whatever's standing here, I can feed myself with. Now, this becomes of a great importance as we go forward into the land and as we go forward into this word, rather, to today, and then we get ready to prepare to go into this land. We need to have an understanding of this. Deuteronomy chapter 24, 19 and 22. We're still in the law on this. And then we're going to Deuteronomy chapter 23, 5. Deuteronomy chapter 24, 19 and 22, Yekai Okay, 24, 19 and 22, and it reads on this wise, When you reap your harvest in the field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It hmm. shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that Yahweh el Helkah may bless you in all of the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the, bow, the bows again or the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Misraim. Therefore, I command you to do this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this was set up for we to understand that when we go through the harvest time, right, in the summer, and you get all of the fruits of your labor, you can pick up whatever you want from the center of your field. But if you drop a head of a sheep, or if you drop a sheep, and it was bound up, leave it. Leave it. If you dropped an olive or olives, leave it. <laughs> leave it. And for those who are, you know, full of yayin, you know, wine, you know, you leave, leave the grapes. Leave the grapes. It's for the poor, for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Now, what a just and righteous nation who did this, which our people, if we had done this rightly, we would have become. These are provisions that are set up for the poor and for the disinherited and for those who are fatherless and widowed, that these are what I call the caretaking system of that nation, not a welfare system for the nation, but a caretaking system for the nation that it comes straight from the creator who is the author of the earth. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. So he being the author behind it, knowing that it is used for the food, the health, the well-being, and the good of all people, what if people were poor? And there are people that are poor. There are people that were poor today. And Yahweh Yahshua said, the poor you will have what you win. All the time. So if you're going to have the poor with you all the time, wouldn't it be wise 
for us as a people to put in place provisions that address the needs of the poor. This is why Thanks. when we took up the tithe, the tithe was not in physical money. The tithe was from the what? The first 10% that you gave that came out of your land. I admit. Back. You gave Amen. back so we could feed the hungry, the poor, and the fatherless, and the widow. The church has got this all backwards. You telling Dang. me the money to tie 10% of my income so you can buy a car. Because, see, if you tied a food, right, walk with yep. me. If you tied something that's from the earth, which is a perishable, you got to use it to feed people. You ain't got to use it to ride in some materialistic vehicle. So you can Dang. look good in vanity? That's what that foolishness is all about. You trying to provide for the first lady of the so-called church some mink coat? You know, kill an animal and take its life so you can dress warm? No. <clears throat> Buy a new house? No. See, this whole line of religiosity is skewed the word. It skewed it. The word is not skewed. I said it skewed the word because it's not teaching the truth. And so the people are not benefiting from the most high's word because the leaders in these various different places of what I call heroism in the bowels of teaching falsehood have deceived the people. Because the people who really want the truth before they find out the big lie, just wait, just bear with me, go to these buildings that they call churches because they want to hear the word. But if they are a tear, they're not going to receive the word. Oh. Huh? Did you hear Dang. that? If they're okay. a tear, they're not going to receive the word. Hallelujah. Oh, if they're wheat that went to the church and you hear what they teach and you know it's not the word, the wheat is going to get up and leave that church. Hallelujah. If you are wheat and if you are a tear, you're going to stay right there until you have been sent out as an assignment to be sold by the wicked one amongst the wheat. You heard what I said. Mm. Tell it, hallelujah. Okay, so just wait now, because we've got to walk through this. You've got to go back into your recesses of your ancient historical path and become that farmer. Ak, you've got to become that farmer. Akot, Aki, Akoti, you got to go back into your ancient historical path and what your occupation was then. You were farmers. Mm. Somebody didn't prove me wrong, because if we were, I say we were master agrarians, master farmers. Look, they brought us here to labor in the tobacco fields, master farmers. Brought us here to labor in their cotton fields, master farmers. Brought us here to labor in their sugar cane fields. Somebody talk back to me. Don't you see that if you weren't the master of the earth and understood how she moved in her seasons, they wouldn't have brought you here to stimulate the economy. Oh, oh no. truth. Hmm. Mm. Hallelujah. No, just look at it and say, oh, y'all brought us here to work. What you work in? In fact, in every avenue of what made this nation great, you were the author behind it. Hmm. Okay. They didn't have the understanding of time, so Benjamin Banneker built the first clock in Washington, D.C. Somebody right. talk back to me. They That's didn't right. understand what I call logistics, so he had to build Washington, D.C. and lay it out on a schematic for them. They didn't understand how electricity worked. Don't talk to me about Khan or Com Edison. I want to hear about Latimer, who built the tungsten steel that gave Thomas Edison the light bulb. Don't you tell me about nothing this heathen did. I stop at the light every day, and the red, the yellow, and the green was put together by Garrett Morgan. You were the minds behind this. Hmm. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So if I'm telling you this about your history, ain't nothing black about it. Don't tell me to wait to February about some called black history. Every day is Hebrew History Month. 
Every day is Hebrew History Day. You are in the season of Yah's feast. You were master agrarians. That's why they brought you here. Hmm. They brought you here for that. So now, if you did that for other people, won't you do that for yourself? Huh? Mm. Yeah. Think about it. We're very knowledgeable. We want to talk about the GMOs and the artificial this and the GBH and the HGB and the cattle. Then we need to make food for ourselves. We need to grow up, beloved. You got if what you're saying is true, and it is, then don't just point out the problem. Manifest the solution. If we are being poisoned by the water that is fluoridated, then you need to go to a place where you can get clean spring water from the earth that is electrified with the electrolytes that is 10.2 pH. Hmm? You hear that? If what you're saying is true and the food is poisoned over here, then you need to, unless you're going to keep eating their food, we need to make food come from the earth ourselves. Huh? Yeah. Don't just keep pointing it out. It's good to point it out, but all you're doing is pointing out the problem, which is good. What's the solution to this issue? The solution is we must do for ourselves. You've got to take our mouths out of the kitchen, out of the restaurants. You've got to take your stomach out of the golden corrals of your enemy. <laughs> you come on now. Think about it. So I want to help you, us, we go back. When I say, well, I'm going home and I'm going to farm, people giggle. Go ahead and giggle. I can feed myself. Huh? huh? Go ahead. Giggle at me all you want to. That brother wants to go and sit in a hammock and swing. Yes, I do. And you've been working and laboring as long as I have. You want some rest downtime as we all want it on the Shabbat. The work is not over. The work is starting. When well, we're talking about going home, I ain't talking about driving no fancy car. You'll find me in the backyard swinging on a hammock somewhere with some beloved daughter Zion tossing me some grapes. Yes, I said that. Hallelujah. That's the day I look forward to. What about you? Do you want to stay here in America and be a perpetual runner in the rat race that's absolutely going nowhere? Is that what this is all about? Because when I read about Yah's feast days, they point us to a place and a direction that is contrary to the American dream. Aki, take us into the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, 5. Let's look at that. Hmm. Okay. Twenty-three five. Uh, I stand corrected. Okay. Okay. 23.5. No, no, regular, regular. Regular. That's 23.5. 23, 24, and 25. Okay. Deuteronomy 23, 24, and 25, and it reads on this wise. Go ahead. When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of the grapes at your pleasure, but you shall not put any in your container. When you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hands, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so now do we all understand that when we go home and when our ancestors were at home, you can walk through somebody, you know, vineyard right by the edge, and you can pick up all the grapes you want that you could carry in your pocket, huh, or in the hem of your garment. But you should not, if you had a container, could you pick up them grapes and put them in there? Huh? No, no. Are you sure? Okay. Okay, let's go to the next verse. When you come into the neighbor's standing grain. So now we got barley, huh? We got wheat, hmm? We got spelt, 
Now you walking through the style and take y'all back so we walk down the right way, walking through the standing grain. This is going to be significant. Just bear with me. Can you with your hand pluck the heads of the grain? What's in the head of the yep. grain? Huh? Come on. Don't be afraid. All right, I'll help you. The head of the grain is the nutrient that produce the food that you later call bread. So if you seed, yes, seed is in the head. Seed is in, so if you eat the seed, huh? You're eating the spelt. You're eating the wheat. You're eating the barley in its most natural form. It goes down through your esophagus where digestion begins, goes into your stomach, and is absorbed because your enzymes are looking up saying, thank you, this is not a cheeseburger. Thank you, this is not pork. This is living food. So if you're sending that seed down, you are regenerating and not degenerating. That's what yeah. this is all about. That's a regeneration. You can walk through and eat the heads. The seed is there. If you eat the seed, you have more nutrient value than it was if you would take it, beat it down, turn it into flour, and then turn it into bread from the baking process. Don't you know anytime you put something in the oven, you create what is called the degeneration of your food. That's why those who eat food raw, they live longer. They look better. Because they're eating food in its natural form. Okay. We're eating food cooked. If you're cooking good food, you're not going to get the results if you're eating vegan or if you're eating raw. And if you, y'all forbid, cooking bad food, then what in heaven's name do you think is going to happen to your body temple? You are creating a cycle of degeneration. And what you're doing, you are becoming a partner with Satan who wants to kill, maim, and destroy. He is a co-partner in death. They are friends together. That's what this is all about. Huh? Did you hear that? Did you understand what I'm saying? So you got to change your diet. Your diet has no longer got to be D-I-E, uh-oh, hyphenated with a T, that's die, T, diet. Your diet needs to become a kayak, a life-giving food, hmm. life-giving change. It's a simple verse. It says you're supposed to eat the standing grains in the head. What's in it? You might type it right on point. Seed is in there. Huh. You eat the seed, you live longer. Wait a minute, what you mean? Well, let's take you back in the Wayback Machine in the 70s and the 80s when you ate watermelon. Don't you all remember the old wives' tale? Oh, boy, oh girl, if you eat that watermelon seed, a watermelon going to grow out your head. And you be afraid. <laughs> Don't you eat that apple? Eat that apple seed. The apple, gonna grow, grow, apple tree going to grow out your head. That's an old wives' tale. What I'm trying to get you to understand is the heathen through GMO then took the seeds out of the food. Huh? Peter extracted the seeds out of the food. We are supposed to eat food with seed in itself. Not no seedless grapes. Huh? Not no seedless watermelon. Oh, my goodness. Everything that you're supposed to eat is supposed to have a seed in it. That's why when you walk through your neighbor's field, you know, ancient times, go ahead and eat the standing head of the grain. It's good for you. Just don't put a lot in your basket. That looks like a harvest. And if you're doing that, you're taking without permission, and that is against the law. That is unlawful. And the next verse that he read, when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you should not use your sickle as a harvest on your neighbor's standing grain. Let's look how this played out in the Besor real quickly. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. Through 13. And then we will go and come back into Leviticus once we deal with the books of Genesis where wheat first appears in its form for feasting and harvest. Now, can you take us to Matthew 12, verse 1 through 13, sir? Okay. Matthew, Matthew Yahoo, chapter 12, verse 1 and 13 through 13. And it reads on this wise. At that time, Jehoshaphat went through the grain fields on Shabbat, yeah. and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck the heads of the grain 
and to keep and to eat. Sleek out, and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Shabbat. But he said to them, Have you not read what Dawi did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of Yah and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in HaTorah, the law, that on the Shabbat, the priests of the temple profane the Shabbat and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is a dawn even on the Sabbath. Hmm. Now when he departed from there, he went into their synagogue, and hmm. behold, there was a man who had a withered hand and had asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Shabbat? that they may accuse him. Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on Shabbat, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of, of how many more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Shabbat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the good that was being done was it was lawful and permissible for them to walk through the standing grains of the field and to eat the heads, which were the seeds, while they were walking around on the Shabbat because they were hungry and they were not harvesting. Even though it was the harvest season, they were not working. They were simply eating freely. And if the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, though they're not mentioned here, but the Purushim, the Pharisees, really understood the law, they wouldn't have opened their mouth and said a thing. But because they were pretentious and wanted to be seen by men, thinking that they knew the law as they do in the letter, but not in the spirit, they would not condemn the righteous. For when he cites that the priest do the sacrifices on the Shabbat and are blameless. It is because they always make the daily offerings from the first day, and there's a daily offering on the seventh day. But Yah wrote in his Torah that they were to make two offerings on the Shabbat, one for the regular daily offering and the other one as an atonement, since they had to make the offering perpetual, then he would release them through the atonement of them making the other sacrifice. David ate the showbread, which is not lawful to do unless you are a descendant of Lewi through his son Aharon. But because Abba looked at his heart and knew David, a man after his own heart, and was only eating, not out of pretension, but because to feed him and his soldiers, Yah desires mercy, not sacrifice. Not the letter. It is never the letter of the law. The letter brings judgment. When he deals with us, it is in the spirit. Book of James says, mercy outweighs judgment. And so we say the spirit overrules the order because the order is perfect, but the spirit is the manner in which Israel is rightly governed because it's Yah's spirit upon the waters, the people in the beginning or the face of the earth that brought forth the creation of everything out of his word. His word is not going to contradict itself. You, we, I, us simply need to look and ask, what does this mean in the spirit? 
What is he trying to convey to us in the spirit? What is the literal meaning of Shavuot? And what is the spiritual connection of Shavuot to Israel right now in 2016? Hmm. Leviticus is the blueprint of how we are to number keeping the weeks. Now, let's look at Exodus 16. Hmm. Exodus 16. Or rather, Exodus 23, rather. Okay. All right. 23 of Exodus. And we did this over the lesson on the car, uh, on our comic sheet. We read this whole thing. We're going to take the excerpts. We're going to focus on Shavuot. I can read just verse 23.16, and then from 23.16, take us to Exodus 34.22, and then we're going to go back into Leviticus 23, 15, and 16. And we spent almost about an hour on this subject in the lesson part. So this is kind of bear with me. Go ahead, Aki. 23, 16 only? Yes, just, tw just 23, 16, and 17. Because, see, we've okay. passed as a nation, and in the time, we've passed unleavened bread. So the feast that is upon us, Machar, tomorrow, it's verse 16, and what we should do in 16 and 17. Read on. Okay. And the feast of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of end gathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field, three times in the year, all your meals shall appear before Yahweh El. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 34, 22. So say she ought to write down, okay, three times in a year, hmm, okay, the males need to appear. Appear before him where? Aren't you appearing before him today? You've appeared in the Shabbat. Every time you wake up and he wakes you up, you appear before him. But there's a specific time you are to present yourself, which is the better term than simply appear. Three times in a year, men in Israel are to present themselves before the Most High. What does it say in Exodus 34, Aki? 34.22, and it reads on this wise, And you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Hallelujah. In verse 23. Okay. Three times in the year, all your men shall appear before Yahweh. Yahweh, Elohe le Israel, for I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's three times in a year. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, one. The Feast of Kog Shavuot, two, called the Feast of Weeks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks. The Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Kog Sudkot called tabernacles. Three times in a year, we should appear before the Creator. We should not appear before the Creator empty-handed. Leviticus chapter 23, specifically verses 15 and 16. Remember now, so we deal with Kog Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. We count one week, all the way up to seven, and the days that are within the beginning of the first week to the end of the seventh week is 49. 49 days. 23, 15 through 16. Okay. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Shabbat, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Shabbats shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to Yahweh. Hallelujah. So the new grain offering is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So you were to make your offering on the 50 day at sunset tonight going into Mahar is what is called Chag Shavuot. 50 days out of Egypt, we got the law. 50 days out of captivity in bondage in Egypt, Yah gave us his Torah. And exactly 50 days 
from the resurrection of Yahshua HaMashiach, the Ruach HaKodesh descended upon the 120 in the upper room at the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 1. So they all parallel and coincide. There's no deviation. There's some what I call repetitive mirroring going on in your ancient history 2,000 years ago and in your ancient history 3,650 years ago. You got some history. Your history just didn't start when Carter Woodson come up with Negro History Month and then it bloomed into, rather, Negro History Week, and then it bloomed into Negro History Month. Your story, our story don't begin in 1619. Our story begins all the way back in Gan Edan. Our story begins when your father Abraham leaves the city of Ur of the Chaldeans and goes to the promised land. That's when your story begins. That's when your history begins. Micro history ain't even 400 years. That's a smidgen of history. But the history of the Hebrews, the history of the Israelites, goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. That's your history. You just didn't come up on the earth yesterday and somebody created you because we make sure that you know and understand that the Negro and that phrase is a descriptive, it is a byword and a proverb that was out of the mind of the Portuguese and the Spaniards, negra, from the Greek necro, which means dead. That is not who you are. Y'all didn't call Abram the Negro. He called Abram the Hebrew. The Negro was made in America. The Hebrew was brought forth across the waters of the Euphrates and the Tigris, and a Hebrew means one who has crossed over. So if you're a Hebrew that crossed over, you are not keeping Christmas. You are not keeping Thanksgiving. You are not keeping the 4th that you lie. You are not keeping Sunday. You are not keeping Mother's Day, and here come Father's Day right around the corner. You're not keeping none of that. You are keeping Yah's days. The difference between the behavior and the practices of a Negro and a Hebrew are like night and day because one is in the darkness and the other one is in the light. That is a difference. When you were awakened in the great awakening, Yahweh chose to bring you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. So a part of the enlightenment process is that you become aware of your language, of your food, of your clothing, of his high holy days, and more importantly, his laws, his statutes, his commandments, which the high holy days are a part of, and in his Torah is his Shabbat. So you come and do yeah. these things to be obedient. You want to be a good son and a good daughter unto Abba. And so he, in his blessing upon you, would bless you with the bountifulness of the land we are yet to inherit. Deuteronomy chapter 818. What does that say? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. It reads on this wise, And you shall remember Jehovah Elohecha, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his breach, his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Hallelujah. Uh-huh. So the Most High, in his blessing upon us, he is the one who brings forth the gifts and the blessings out of the earth. I keep, if you would be so kind, in Deuteronomy 8, and 7 and 8. Read that. Deuteronomy 8, 7 and 8. And it reads on this wise. For Yahweh Elohecha is bringing you into walk in his way. I'm going to read it again. 
For Yahweh Eloheka is bringing you into walk in his ways and to fear him. Hmm. Wait a minute, Rega, Rega. Deuteronomy 8, verse 7 and 8. For Yahweh Eloheka is bringing you into a good land, a go. land of brooks of waters, a, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Hallelujah. And what else does 9 say about the land that we are going to inherit? Now, what I'm saying to you is when you talk about going to that land and Israelites tell you something opposite of the word, you got to rebuke them. Oh, don't Dang. go to that land. Uh, that people, people are being killed in that land. And you live right around the corner when gunshots fired last night. Hmm. Oh, you live yeah. right down the block where somebody in Chicago, nine people murdered in over the so-called Mother's Day weekend. But you want no. us not to go to Israel because of your fear. That's your fear. That's not my fear. You buying oh, yeah. into somebody else's fear? What does the word say about that land? Read that again, verse 7. That land. Verse 7. That for Yahweh, Elohim, is bringing you into a good land, a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Hallelujah. So, so he's going to give you a land that's full of food, a land where you will eat bread, spelt wheat, barley, till you are full. You will not lack for anything. In fact, the land that we are going to inherit is the land full of wealth, iron and copper. You're talking about precious yeah. metals. Precious metals. Those things are in your land. In fact, your land will provide you with everything that you need if you go back to the Creator and keep His commandments and His laws and His statutes. He will give you the blessings of Abraham, our father, and the sheer tender mercies of David, and that land will burst forth, and it will pour out blessings to you. You just got to trust his word. You got to put everything and everybody that is contrary to his word behind. Oh, yeah. That's all you got to do. If you keep allowing them people to hold on to you, as I told you, these old relationships that you have, that are counterproductive to your spiritual forward motion and growth, then you allow them to become a stumbling block to you. Hallelujah. Right? You got to go forward. Okay. Let them go. Deuteronomy 16, verse 19. Now, it's going to be, it's going to change because we're about ready in about another two scriptures come out of the Torah. We're going into the history. Deuteronomy sixteen nineteen. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now, judges and judgment that is righteous should be good, just, and good with righteousness everywhere you go. So if you've got your own house and you and your wife and you and your husband together, you have to institute justice and mercy. If you have expanded that household and there are children involved, institute justice and mercy. If you, when we become a community, we have to keep the law according to how it is written with justice and mercy in all your dwellings, in all your gates. Because it doesn't mean a hill of beans. If you don't keep these commandments right and we sitting around just doing the feast days in our own pretentiousness, and we're not instituting just balances, just scales, righteous laws, righteous commandments, and us being the practitioners of the justice, the goodness, and the mercy. Because if not, you're in the same situation in Israel than what you are right now in the captivities of the lands where we sojourn. There has to be a difference. 
You can't, we can't play religion no more. Huh? You can't play. Ain't you churched out? Come on. Dang. Come on. <laughs> Are we not full of the foolishness of what I refer to as the ecclesiastical institutions of the world who are the leading purveyors of this lie? That oh, please, no more worry about it. They Come are, on. in fact, the seminaries of death. Not, not just seminaries. They're cemeteries of death who are the perpetuators of spiritual lies and falsehoods. Aren't you fed up with that? And if you are, then why won't you take the initiative to make a life better for yourself? Why do you keep on trying to use the lie saying, well, the Creator going to do it? The Creator is doing it. How? He's doing it through you. Hallelujah. Don't you know when a man or woman commits Hallelujah. a country, you know the Creator didn't do it. Well, who did it? You would sit around and say, the devil made me do it. Flip Come Wilson on. used to say in the 70s, the devil made me do it. And dressed in drag like a woman called Gerald. Somebody hear what I'm saying. They put the Geraldine. Geraldine. a long time ago. And he would tell mm. you, the devil made him do it. Well, how Come did on. the devil made him do it? The devil put a spirit and the man or woman did the act of adultery. So when Yah make you do it, he puts the spirit of righteousness on you and you do right. Hallelujah. And if you don't get up and go home, you got to trust the spirit. Come on. Yah going to do it through you. That's how he Tell does it. it. Huh? Mm -hmm. You're sitting mm, around yes. in the religiosity of your old Christianized mind and won't get up and lift a finger to do nothing right. Hallelujah. That's Jesus. Christianity that tells you that. Wait on Jesus. Dang. Which Jesus Dang. you going to wait on? The ship or the lying, pasty face cracker that you've been worshiping? Take that image off your wall. Come on. Huh? Unless you're gonna march to some foolishness of a drum beater that's not Yah. That's Alleluia. what you're gonna do, Israel. Jesus ain't coming back, but I know one huh. who is good and just. I met. And from the beginning of the book, in the book of Genesis 3:15, he's been coming to redeem Israel. Come yes, on. He is. Come on. You ain't got to march. What you marching for? This ain't your land anyway. Hallelujah. You're supposed to be crying out. You got it backwards. March. March. You can't see the handwriting on the wall, Israel. I can see it. Mr. Zimmerman then put a gun out on the market for some type of auction. And Tell five it. years ago, he got $5,000. And yesterday, somebody offered him $65 million for it. Hallelujah. Huh? Oh goodness. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It tells you what they think about our lives. And you mm -hmm. are for sport and for prey and for quick and easy seizure. That's in the scriptures. So Israel has become a prey to the heathens. You can flash back with me if you dare choose to. And you will go back to 1987. And there was a movie called What? It says that you would call the most villainous criminal on the face of the earth. Come on. It's what they referred to you as. It Come came on. out the mouth of Hillary Clinton. Come on. In the movie, it's talked about that you would be a spoil and a prey came out right behind boys in the hood. Huh. Come on. Don't you see? They keep telling you things going on. Oh, my goodness, they have victimized you and vilified you. That's why they can lay their hands on you and won't nobody do nothing. Ain't nobody doing nothing. And the so-called Negro leadership ain't stood up and condemned nothing that we're talking about. And you want to stay here? You must don't love your children. Yeah, I said it to you. I love you. Got to tell you the truth. You must don't love your wives and you must don't love yourself. To stay in a house that's Fully in flame that's burning up all around and you sitting around chewing some doggo tobacco talking about boss are we sick. Master of our house is on fire. You better get up out that house before you be consumed in the destruction that's coming. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> sitting around. Doggone economy about to fall out from under her again. So-called free market. 
Heathens tell you all the time that if you fall on your face in business, you fail indeed. Just get back up and declare bankruptcy. Then why in the heck didn't you declare bankruptcy in 2007 and 2008 with all your banks bare stern? Huh? Why didn't you declare bankruptcy? The entire economy was falling right in front of us. And what did they do? They forced the American people. You're part of the slave concept in what we call the great captivity. Forced you to pay taxes to the tune of $787 billion to bail out corporations. Somebody talk that to me. But you didn't bail out the poor, the disinherited, the despised, and the rejected. And when we tell you we want our reparations, you say forget what happened to you. Well, I said, forget the hell what happened to the banks. That's what I'm saying to you. Why should I care what happened to the banks? Why should I care what happened to Zimmerman? Every last one of these heathens that have laid their hands on our children have got off clean and scot free. I'm crying out to y'all. It's okay. It's okay. Tell the truth. Hallelujah. Really understand what I'm saying. Man, you got to be learning the book of Deuteronomy where it says you should be driven mad by the sight that your eyes will see. Isn't that prophecy true? Hey. You walk around in the day and you grope at noonday like a blind man that gropes at darkness. At evening you say, oh, I wish it was morning. At morning you say, I wish it was day. We are the living proof and testimony that that word is real. Come on. It's okay, you know, come on. what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Why I care about a bank? How the heck you gonna care about what a bank do? And you go to some other bank and they all in cahoots together under the Federal Reserve Act and they wanna charge you two dollars and fifty cents for your own money. Come on. Huh. Hallelujah. Huh? They want to charge you for something that you call them and tell, well, you know, this check may bounce. Could you cut me some slack? And they hit you with a $35 interest fee on both ends. Now you $70 in debt plus the debt of the check you wrote. Man, that is nothing but financial slavery. Ain't you tired of this system? When you going to get ready to come out? I'm asking you to come out. You ain't ready to come out. You like being in hell. You like being persecuted. Your women raped. Children sodomized. They got same gender bathrooms planned. And if you don't join into the fray, whatever school you are, then you're going to be taxed and fined. Don't you see the deception all around you? Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. And you got time to sit up and judge each other? Mm -mm. No, 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 no. You better sit up and love one another. You better stand up and love one another because they got something planned for us that is of biblical proportions because they know the time of the end is here. Our people are the only ones that don't know the time their end is here. And they sitting around clapping their hands and stomping their feet to Negro spirituals talking about Lordy, Lordy, Lord. Cut that foolishness out. That is a negative, condescending, counterproductive, emotional expression that is not spiritually edifying and has nothing to do with the law. They're about to make Dang. America great again. Dang. Yeah, that's what they heathen think. Well, he's going to bring the judgment of the Most High down. And I'm good. if he comes to office, Hallelujah. I want him to come to office. Not for the persecution that's coming. I want him to come to office for the judgment because he's going to tear the skin off their backside. Oh, I ain't saying that in no hatred. I'm telling you what's going to happen. When we get through this class today, you're going to see the Creator deal with them. Come on. Oh. He's going to deal with them. Hey, you, look, man, let me tell you something. One man in Israel, back in 1989, when we were studying what was called the New World Order then, and it was hush-hush, because you couldn't say New World Order out in the public back then, huh? Because it was a secret. Hmm. Huh? Those of you who know what I'm talking about know I'm telling you the okay. truth. Okay. Huh? Come on. Yes, sir. And then there was an invasion into Kuwait. And Saddam, who wasn't really insane, told them, you are holding on to oil fields that belong to us because Kuwait was annexed, and that uh -huh. oil belongs to us. 
And uh-huh. behind the scenes, they were meeting with the Carlisle group, and they were meeting with the Arabs under the leadership and the friendship of the Saudi regime, because Saudi Arabia was worried. He said, what you telling us this what I got to show you what's going to happen? And because we got a short-term memory, you got to get long-term memory. Hallelujah. And so they cooked up a plan to where when he invaded, then the Bush administration would garner all the support Uh-oh. of the surrounding nations.